so I guess we'll, we'll just start. Um, I, you know, the title of this thing, can you all hear back there? Yeah, there's, there, I mean, it's kind of weird, you know, talking out there. It's like, um, yeah. I think we ought to have, ought to have sherry, cheese, crackers, and beer. Yeah. That would draw a crowd. Yeah, that would draw a crowd, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, can you hear back there, your genetics department crowd? <laughs> Um, you know, the title of this thing was Mating Mice and Men, right? Okay. It, the title is not entirely facetious. I, um, it sounds that way. Obviously, you, you know, you can't do this in, in vivo, you know, in the whole animals. I was imagining Ann Landers getting lots of letters, you know, complaining about husbands that ate cheese in bed all night and things like that. But that's really not <laughs> what I'm talking about. Um, it would actually, if, if we could get matings between species, it would be a very interesting sort of thing. Uh, a great deal of information, in fact, all of our information about inherited characteristics, of course, comes from matings within a species. And uh, a great deal could be gained if you could get matings, say, between uh, mice and men or mice and rats. But this is impossible in the animal because of certain barriers to the development of the offspring from such matings between two species. But what I'm going to talk about today is a fairly new concept, and um, it has to do with the mating of two cells which are being grown in a laboratory. Now, in situations like this, it is possible to mate cells between two species, um, and this has a great advantage. Um, this is an important technique. It's been developed rather slowly since about 1960. Um, the pace has gathered in about the last three years. And now uh, attention has been focused really on three very important problems which the use of the mating of two cells in the laboratory can answer. And I've written on the blackboard um, what these three important areas are. The first one is the location of human genes on human chromosomes. Uh, the second one is the question of why a liver cell is a liver cell instead of a, a nerve cell or a skin cell or hair cell. That's the problem of differentiation. And the third is the um, certain studies uh, related to the problems of control of the growth of cancerous cells can be answered by using the matings of two cells in the laboratory. I'm going to talk, uh, first, um, first I'm going to talk to you about what the, how these cells are derived and how they're put in a culture and how they're grown in a laboratory. And second of all, how they are fused and actually mated in the laboratory. And um, then I'm going to address the first two of these questions. The third, the work on the third one is still very equivocal. It's very new and it's not very sound yet. So I'm not going to get around to the cancer part of this. Um, well, I'm going to be talking, I'll probably use the word somatic, the phrase somatic cell frequently. Um, by somatic cell, um, I mean simply any cell from the body of any mammal taken from any place on the body with the exception of the germ cell, that is an egg or sperm. Because it's been shown that you can grow cells from parts of the body, um, but it, to date no one has been successful in cultivating either an egg cell or a sperm cell in the laboratory. Um, before I show you how cells are taken out of an animal and put into culture, I'm just going to draw on the board a generalized cell. Um, this would be the outer membrane of the cell, an animal cell, an outer membrane. Uh, inside the cell is the nucleus. The nucleus contains certain chemical material, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, DNA, uh, which is of which the chromosomes are composed. Now, the, the chromosomes, I'm going to draw them here like this. They, at some stages of development, they actually look like little squiggly rods like this. Uh, bear all of the genetic information which make you a human being. And the chromosomes of a mouse bear all the genetic information which make that organism a mouse. You see. Um, out here is what's known 
known as the cytoplasm, and this is generally where all of the, the um, chemical reactions go on that are necessary to provide all of the, the chemicals necessary for, say, the, uh, in a liver, for example, I mentioned liver over here, the detoxification of alcohol, which the liver does. Also, out here are, are well, like this. these are the chemical building blocks from which the chromosomes are made, and there are chemical building blocks which are taken from the outside through the membrane um, and are put together to make other substances which are put out of the cell, so two of these together, like that. So this is sort of a chemical factory out here, and this is the, the nucleus is the storehouse of all of the genetic information. Um, Now this, this slide depicts taking tissue uh, out of a mouse. Uh, it could be any tissue. Uh, let's say we've taken a little pinch of his liver. It's a slicing of a pinch of liver. This is put in the uh, special sterilized dish, we call it a petri dish. And then the tissue is treated with a certain enzyme, which is trypsin. Now trypsin is, uh, dissolves proteins and all cells in a body are, um, well, you could say in a very simple way that they're fairly much stuck together by substances which are largely protein in nature, you know, sort of glued together. Trypsin dissolves away this extraneous glue around the individual cells, which looks something like that, and so that you can make a suspension of single cells and not push it pieces of, of liver tissue. Um, now, this single cell suspension is put into a um, nutrient medium. Now this, this is um, it's sort of like a, a soup. It's, uh, it's got salts in it, and it has sugars in it, it has um, everything which um, a living mammalian cell is known to need. Um, then it's grown at 37 degrees. Now that's centigrade, that's body temperature. And um, after, in this initial step, not every one of these cells will grow out into a, a will divide in the dish. Actually, only a few of them will. This is a very interesting phenomenon. It's called uh, transformation. Uh, we know now that generally, the ability of a cell to grow out uh, from a piece of tissue into a medium like this in a dish uh, has to do with being transformed by a, a virus. A virus somehow attacks the cell. Uh, the, the actual mechanism by which that cell is, is uh, told to go ahead and grow is almost, well, somewhat known, somewhat unknown. But usually there is some sort of extraneous virus implicated. Uh, okay, so some of these cells then, from this cell suspension, will grow up. And as they grow and divide, the cell will simply divide and pinch off, and there'll be two cells where there was once one, and the two will make uh, four, and so on. So all over the bottom of this dish, there is a growth of cells. Each one of these is a cell. And eventually it goes until it gets, becomes very dense. Now, at this point, of course, uh, in the laboratory, you want to keep these cells going on and on and on forever. You don't want to keep having to go back to the mouse. So you do uh, make serial passages of this, and that involves taking a small sample of this and making it, gluing it with some of this nutrient medium and putting it in a brand new dish. Again, they're grown at, at body temperature. They grow up again to this. And you can theoretically, um, well, with almost all the cell lines that are in culture and laboratories now, you, uh, as far as we know, they will grow forever. Uh, there is one exception to that. Uh, but generally, they do grow forever. Um, in, in laboratories now all over the country, there are, there are cultures of human white blood cells. There are cultures of mouse white blood cells. I've got these right over here. Uh, there are cultures of rat brains. Um, mouse brains, rat livers, mouse livers, Chinese hamster, ovaries, uh, human lungs. Uh, the list is, is not endless, but it's pretty long, you see. And all of these cultures were more or less derived in this way. Now, suppose I wanted to put you in the culture right here. All I would need to do is to take a skin pinch from the back of your neck and mix it with this trypsin right here and go through this process, and you would be in culture indefinitely. <laughs> That's frightening. Yeah, well, um, 
Now, as, as I say, you can take cells from different tissues, like the skin pinch I just described, or the liver, or the... And in general, when this, those cells are grown in the laboratory, they retain some of the characteristics of the tissue from which they were obtained, uh, which is an interesting point to remember when we get down to considering this, this second point. Um, okay, now I want to mention, I think, what a clone is, because we're going to be coming to this in a minute. If you take only three cells out of this dense business here and put it in the nutrient, nutrient medium and put it in another dish, those three cells will be at different places on the dish. And, and this one cell, when it grows and divides, will make a colony of its um, offspring right around it. So when I speak of a clone or a colony, which is represented there, uh, it means all of the descendants of one Anyway, that's what um, somatic cells and somatic cell lines are. Um, about, oh, it's a long time ago now. It was in 1960. Um, there was a laboratory at the Institut Gustave Roussy in Paris that were working with these somatic cell lines. And they noticed that on that background, you remember of all the cells in the dish, that there were, there were little humps of cells growing over the background, so like little mountains on the flat background. And when they, they began examining these, it became evident that they, these, um, well, this is what happened, it became evident that two of the cells that were growing on the back of the dish had fused together in this manner. Let's see, here's cell number one with its nucleus, and cell number two with its nucleus. And in some manner, those two cells had fused together to give one larger cell, and the two nuclei had fused together to give a larger nucleus, which they, dis they um, uh, did some work on, and they discerned that it contained all of the nuclear material from this one and this one together in this large nucleus. Now, this was the first time that, that um, cells had been uh, fused in culture, that anybody had to had determined that this didn't happen. And these are called hybrid cells. Now, it turned out to be more than just a curiosity. Um, through the years, uh, since that time, there have been developed techniques for inducing these, these hybrids to occur. And there are methods for selecting just exactly the hybrid that you want. And that's what I'm going to talk about now for a minute. Um, the, the method of inducing this hybrid is to simply add a virus to a, a growing culture of cells. Now, this virus is called the Sendai virus of Japan. It was isolated uh, by a man named Okada in Japan. It was isolated from a little boy who had pneumonia in the hospital. And this virus has a particular property of causing two cells growing in culture to fuse together to form one hybrid cell. Now here's roughly the technique in the laboratory. For the moment, just ignore these um, initials under here. You mix certain quantities of cells. Now I've shown you free cells here as if they're blood cells uh, don't grow in those flat dishes, but they grow simply up in the liquid nutrient medium right, as they would grow in the circulatory system of your body. Um, so you mix two quantities of the cells that you want to fuse together and in a con very concentrated way. And then you add the Sendai virus. Uh, and then they're incubated for a short time at cold temperature and then for a short time at warm temperature. At which point you see cells which have, uh, you see that these two single cells have joined together to form a, a cell that has two nuclei. And then after a somewhat undetermined length of time, you see that these two nuclei have fused together to form a cell that has only one nucleus, but now has all of the content of the two original parent cells. Now, at this point, one would take this mixture, you see, and put it in um, a situation in which each individual cell could make a clone, like the clones that I 
and, and grow up so that you can grow the hybrids and they, they stay as hybrids and you can grow them just as you did the single cells. Um, uh, this is to give you some idea. I wanted you to go away from here with some science, not just all on the top. So uh, this is, I wanted to show you exactly what the virus does to fuse these cells. Um, here we started out, uh, here are the two cells that we're going to eventually fuse into the hybrid. And this, this little virus is made out of um, RNA, which is uh, very closely related to the DNA material of the nucleus. It has around it a little membrane envelope. It's like a little mini cell. And it comes and actually attaches to the mem outer membrane of the cell. Now at this point, both of these cells are attached together at their outer membranes by this virus in the middle. Now, what happens at this point is, is very well known. When, um, the cells start out actually fairly far, far apart. Um, because every cell in the body, as well as cells in culture, excrete materials. They excrete uh, sugars and proteins. They have a goopy outer coat. So when they first come, come together with the virus, uh, that outer coat is digested away so that the membranes are brought together in a very close approximation. And what digests away that outer coat are more chemicals in the cells which are released onto their own outer coat and they just simply digest away all these sugars and proteins and the membranes are brought close together. And when you get to the point where the, the distance of the molecules in the membrane of the cell is no, is no smaller than the distance of the molecules between the two membranes here, you can have a reaction within the membrane. And it heals up, and it gets kind of confused about which way it should heal. This shows the digestion. Over here, this represents the healing of the membrane. Then after the digestion has taken place, you see, and after the virus is inside the cell. Now the membrane simply reheals. And uh, it doesn't know, it doesn't have any orientation, it doesn't know how it heals, so it heals in such a way that these two are now attached together and the two nuclei then wind up inside the same cell. Uh, the, the next stage would be the one illustrated on the previous slide, that is the fusion of these two nuclei to make one. Um, well, now this was a, a very Im important um, advance in this field. And because now people are at will able to make these hybrids by the simple addition of Sendai virus. Um, there was another problem that had to be taken care of before you could use this method to answer uh, good questions. And that, this is the following problem. Suppose you wanted to take human cells and mouse cells and fuse them to make hybrids by using the Sendai virus. You'd start out with a pot of human cells and a pot of mouse cells and put the virus in. You'd have three different kinds of fusions. Uh, what you desire is a hybrid cell which has mouse and human nuclear material in it. So you start out with some mouse cells here and some human cells here, and there are a lot of them. And you add the virus. You have the virus, and then you can have mouse cells fused with mouse cells, those you don't want. You can have what you want, mouse fused with human, or you can have human cells fused with human cells. Now, uh, if there's no way of selecting the particular hybrid you want, any technique like this is useful. You have to be able to pick out exactly what you want. So this is the, this was the next uh, advance. Um, I'll go through it rather quickly. Oh, well, I forgot the orbs. I just wanted to show you some fused cells before I went on. Can you see those? Those, those are our mouse white blood cells that have been fused together. And um, in, the, in, the, in the top cell, there are obviously five nuclei. So five cells have been fused together. Uh, just below that. This is a cell with one nucleus, this is a cell with one nucleus, and this one has five, which resulted through the fusion of, of five cells, although the nuclei I haven't fused together yet. And I think I had another one that was Yeah, 
In this case, you see a cell with two nuclei, and uh, that, the one in the middle actually has 14 nuclei. The virus was very efficient. Okay, now got to get on with the selection disease. Um, ordinarily, the, the chromosomal material, which is DNA, is made in this manner. It's made in the cytoplasm from sugars and amino acids. Amino acids, are you probably all, I'm sure you all know, they're the building blocks for proteins. And ordinarily, the DNA is made like this. But it was found that if you had uh, added a certain chemical called aminoxin, you could simply block this and DNA would not be made. Now, if DNA isn't made, eventually the cell's going to die because it, it needs to divide and it needs new DNA to be made in order to divide and be a whole cell. Um, the way the method works is this. The aminoxin is used to block this normal pathway here. And when that happens, if you if you add a precursor of the DNA, which we call nucleosides, there are enzymes in the cell. No, enzymes. You know, I'm bog down in here a minute. The enzyme is the protein that is coded for by the genes. Now, the enzymes are the controllers of every chemical reaction in the cell. Okay. So, in, in this case, if you block this ordinary pathway, and give cells uh, a certain chemical, you can, uh, if, if the cell has a particular enzyme, in this case, uh, I'll just call them TK and PRT, if, it, if the cell has these enzymes, they can go ahead and make the DNA by sort of an alternate pathway. It's absolutely like going downtown by 13th Street instead of Lincoln Way. Uh, when the 13th Street is, or uh, Lincoln Way is blocked off. Um, and this becomes a selection system because you have to have both of these little uh, protein enzymes in order to get your final product. So if you take the cell, which does not have TK, but does have PRT, and take a cell which does have PRT, but does not have TK, the only cell that can survive is one which has both TK and both PRT. So if you in your mixture, fusion mixture over here, if you use a virus, which will put these two particular cells together, you will get a hybrid cell out, uh, which has both TK and both PRT. Um, and only that, that's the only one that will live. Now, if you want to do it with human and mouse lines, you could, for example, um, by certain treatments, you can be sure that your mouse line has PRT and does not have TK. And by certain treatments, you can be sure that your human line has TK but does not have PRT, so that what you're finally getting at the very end is a human-mouse hybrid that has those chemical characteristics that I just mentioned. Um, well, all right, the, the artificial way of inducing cell hybrids plus a way of selecting just the hybrid you want uh, have now made it possible to answer some very important questions with this system. Uh, before I go on, because I see some puzzled faces a little bit, I mean, does anybody want to ask questions? But please interrupt any time. <laughs> no questions? Okay. Um, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Well, I don't actually know where the one with 14 nuclei did it. Cells which get two nuclei do go ahead and reproduce themselves. But first, they, their nuclei have to fuse. I've, I've seen cases in which cells, by counting the chromosomes, I could tell that there were four nuclei that all fused together. And they gave a large bundle, uh, an enormous nucleus, you know, and it did go ahead and divide. But are there cases where once the nuclei do fuse together, the cell is just somehow inert? Uh, well, see, that's not really known because you're always working with what's, what's growing. So you can say positively that, that what's growing um, came about from the fusion of two cells. Uh, it's hard to say anything about the rest, some cells that die. You know, it's just um, always you look at, sort of look at the positive evidence and you can't always examine the negative. 
Well, um, okay. What, um, in, in these artificially few cells, uh, I just wanted to think about how much does this resemble an egg sperm fusion, you see? Well, in one sense it does. The, uh, the membrane, the cell membrane events that I told you about uh, in regards to this kind of fusion are very similar to the same kind of fusion of membranes that go on between the egg and the sperm. Um, this is becoming clearer, uh, actually, quite recently. Um, these cells are, are, the hybrids, though, are different from the zygote produced by an egg and the sperm in that they have exactly, if you had two cells fusing, they have exactly twice the amount of, of nuclear material that a, than an ordinary zygote would have. You see, from your, from your, uh, the egg and the sperm each contain half of the genetic material which each of your parents have. And so when they're put together, you make one whole. And it doesn't have more and it doesn't have less than uh, any other human being. But these, these hybrids have exactly twice as much um, hereditary material in their nuclei. Um, of course, the other main difference in this artificial fusion procedure is that you can make different species. And you will see as I go on how, why this is becoming increasingly important. Uh, there are other advantages to being able to do matings of this type in the laboratory. And one of them is that you can control what you put in. You obviously cannot go out in the human population and control matings at this point. At any rate, you can't. And then the speed with which you can get your results. You don't have to wait for 25 years to see how a certain uh, characteristic is going to develop. You may not have to wait more than three weeks, you see. So there's certain advantages to this, although certain problems, too. Well, now I want to turn to the uh, biological questions that, that people are attempting to answer using these hybrid cells. Um, the, the very I think I'll take the first one first here, the location of human genes on human chromosomes. Well, first, I want to consider why that's important. I don't know how much you know about your chromosomes, but you have uh, 46 chromosomes. You got 23 from each parent. You have 23 pairs of chromosomes. They um, differ in their appearance. I'm not going to draw all 23 pair, pairs here, but I'll start out with this is pair one, pair two, three, four, three, four, and five. And so it goes on down to uh, 23 pairs, including a pair of sex chromosomes. Uh, the X and the Y look different. The X actually looks something like an X, like this, and the Y looks something like this. Um, you know, you have 46 chromosomes. But I made, the, um, actually last, last uh, quarter, an, an estimate of the number of genes that, that we have, number of possible and inherited characteristics that we can have. And by two separate calculations, I came out to the same number, and that's 90,000. And um, that's a heck of a lot of hereditary material. It's all carried on these 46 chromosomes. And we know very little about it. Um, there is a book that's put out uh, every two or three years. Uh, we're waiting for a new edition now. It's called The Catalog of Phenotypes in Man. Now, a phenotype simply means um, an inherited characteristic that you can, can look at, you can distinguish. That is blonde hair versus brown hair, blue eyes versus brown eyes, red hair. Um, Noah's thumb, uh, attached earlobes, uh, the whole schmagegi, that's phenotypes, okay? There are uh, 1,621 phenotypes known in man, although there are 90,000 genes, almost certainly. Um, of these 1,621 phenotypes, um, th there are 78, which are known to be in the sex chromosomes. Uh, there are 695 that are known to be on, on some other pair of chromosome, but they don't know which one. And the remaining 800 and, I did my arithmetic right, 848, that was 695. Yeah, the remaining 848 
uh, phenotypes that we actually know exist in the population are absolutely unknown. They don't know where they are on these chromosomes. You know. Well, does it matter where they are? It does matter where they are for the following reason. A person is a healthy human being only if he has exactly 23 chrom pairs of chromosomes. And, the, and if those chromosomes have not lost any, any material at all, suppose this chromosome were missing part of itself right here. That person would be a very sick person. If you have 23 pairs, say, and one extra one, let's say, that looks like that, that is a very sick person. A mongoloid is a person who has an extra chromosome 21. And uh, as an example, and this occurs very frequently in the population. Uh, six out of a thousand live births uh, for women under the age of 40, and 19 out of a thousand for women over the age of 45. You see, and that, that's just one abnormality, and that's very high frequency. Um, if, a, if a fellow is missing what's known as the short arm, I'll do it down here, of chromosome 5, so ill, um, it's called the Cri du Chat syndrome, and the child is, uh, can't talk, it has the cry of a cat, um, mentally retarded, and some congenital heart problems, and so on. The other uh, losses of parts of chromosomes that are known cause severe, tragic uh, difficulties for the person. They're always associated with mental retardation and physical problems like congenital heart troubles and, and malformation limbs and so forth. And the reason is it's important to know uh, as much as you can about the location of genes on chromosomes is just simply the following. If we knew what was on the short arm of this chromosome, and we knew what genes were there, and we knew what chemical products those genes coded for, we would be able then uh, therapeutically to give these proper chemicals to the poor child who is born with this deficiency, and there would be a reasonable chance that that individual could develop into a functioning human being. Um, uh, knowing something about the chromosomes themselves is so important now that actually uh, major hospitals in, in several large cities simply routinely look at the chromosomes of all the newborn babies. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just an absolutely routine procedure. Um, so it's, for, for this reason alone, and besides the, the biological sort of curiosity inherent in all biological problems is this very uh, compelling medical reason to find out as much as we can to see about the inherited material on our chromosomes. Um, now, uh, all the information I gave you about how little we know about what, which of our genetic characteristics are carried on which chromosomes um, derives from about 25 years of work which is pretty discouraging. And it's, uh, I'm going to show you now how in the last year and a half, 30 more genes have been mapped using these, these uh, fusion hybrids. It's, uh, it's again a technique which was difficult at, the fr at first, but as it's developed, it's snowballed and uh, people from a lot of labs are cooperating. And if it was 30 in the last year and a half, uh, it's, there, there's, there's going to be a curve like that, because I know it started off with a year and a half ago, only two genes had been mapped that way, and now it's 30, and I suppose the next point may be 300, because the, de the techniques are developing. Um, okay, very simply, the way it works is this. Um, here you have a cell which has been produced by the methods that I've just discussed. And the cell is a mouse and human hybrid cell. Um, during the growth of these cells, from generation to generation, uh, the human chromosomes are lost. You know, they start out with 46, and supposed, um, well, let's draw a, a petri dish here with cells in it. Okay. They grow up, they're very dense, as you saw in that picture. The sample is transferred as the, as the cell, every time a cell divides, that's a cell generation. The sample is transferred, one, two or three of these are put in here and then they grow up again and so on. And when this is done, these serial passages, uh, for many times, you find, find that um, 
you started out, I'm gonna, there, are, there are 40 mouse chromosomes and 46 human chromosomes initially in this hybrid. Now, after several generations, I'm going to put a dotted line here because it takes more than three. There's several generations. You may wind up with a cell that has 40 mouse chromosomes and one human chromosome. Okay. Now, an interesting thing about mice and, and human beings is that we share a lot of these um, small proteins, these enzymes in common. Have ex they, they, do, they carry on exactly the same chemical reactions in mice as they do in us. But they're different in that you can, you can um, almost take a picture of them. Um, now, if you run these enzymes through uh, some starch, it'll separate these enzymes on the basis of their weight. And you can, if you pass an electrical current through them, uh, here's a mouse enzyme, I'm talking about a human enzyme. You pass an electrical current in this direction, it'll carry the enzyme up because of its, its weight and so on to a certain distinct area on this starch base. It'll carry the human enzyme up to a different one. Now they do the same chemical reaction, but they're actually chemically just different enough that they can be separated by means of this, this chemical procedure. And when they're separated, by this electrical current, they can be stained. You actually just see this with your eyes, very clear cut. Now, if you're down to the situation where you have one human chromosome, and there are many of these mouse human enzymes that can be looked at, you can now grow this cell. Uh, you've grown it up and looked at it under the microscope. You've discerned that it has one human chromosome. It can now be grown up into um, a large group of cells like this, and then uh, the cells are mashed up, and extract is made. The extract is put on this uh, starch board right here. The electrical current is passed through, and you look and see whether, in fact, that human enzyme is there or is not there. It's just very simple. Now, if the human enzyme, uh, well, let's give it a real name, LDHA, that is the name of it, is there, and you know that this particular human chromosome is here. We know now that we have this one LDHA on this one human chromosome. Now, the human chromosomes, as I started to draw them, are quite distinctive. Um, and within the last year and a half, techniques have been developed for staining them so that you can distinguish each one. So by using these advanced techniques with the microscope, advanced cytology, we'll be able to distinguish, say, that this one human chromosome is, in fact, uh, say, chromosome 6. And we know that, that that enzyme is there. So now we know that, that chromosome 6 bears the enzyme LDH. That, that's a marker just like blue hair, blue hair, blue eyes or brown hair. Um, and using this technique, um, well, let me see a little more about it, you have to, it's not done just on one cell, it's done on many cells, and there's a very stringent statistical correlation made between the presence of a certain chromosome, human chromosome, and the presence of a human enzyme, and then in other cells, the absence of that same chromosome and the absence of the enzyme. It's not, I mean, it's not an easy technique, and, but it has been very carefully worked out. Um, Using this technique now, 30 different genes, as I've said, have been located on, on their chromosomes. Uh, um, one of the labs who works in this predicts that by the end of this year, every, every single human chromosome will be known to have at least one enzyme marker. And now you, what one can do is to take the data that you get from this kind of work, and it's now being correlated with the old data that you got from, from um, population studies where people have many family histories written down and how blue eyes segregate. And, and they're putting these two lines of data together and that's why things don't be snowballing and shortly we may almost um, <coughs> know as much about our chromosomes as we do about the fruit flies chromosomes. <laughs> that's a sad comment on something, isn't it? Well,
Well, the thing, um, well, in, in terms of the ex, well, some, some of the characteristics which you observe in people can be measured. Uh, I mean, um, for example, hmm, albinism is one, can be related. Uh, you, you see a certain phenotype, um, albino. Uh, they understand the biochemical background of this phenotype and the role of enzymes in it. You see, so if you knew that, it, that if you had some data on those same enzymes from the laboratory, you could relate it to inheritance data about that particular kind of albinism in the population. It, I mean, these aren't just, um, I mean, sometimes these, are, these enzymes are very directly related to the phenotype, you see. And as often as possible, they get, they get enzymes which are, you know, to study. Yeah. That's, that's the way it seems, well, that that's, that's seems to be what happens, is that the, the mouse chromosomes stay, and this, uh, the mechanism isn't quite understood, but the, the human chromosomes are, as you say, sort of driven out by the mouse chromosomes. Um, and this, this had 86 chromosomes totally, and this has 41, and the human and mouse chromosomes look quite differently. So you can really distinguish them just by eye. Uh, this situation also pertains to uh, hybrids between Chinese hamster cultured cells and human cultured cells. In that case, the Chinese hamster cultured cells, because there are uh, chromosomes, uh, Chinese hamster has 22 chromosomes. In that case, the 22 Chinese hamster chromosomes remain, and again, the human cells are lost, and the human chromosomes are lost gradually. It would be random, yeah, yeah absolutely random. And uh, sometimes there are uh, the statistical correlations between what enzymes there and what chromosomes there is sometimes made on cells that have two human chromosomes left, or three. I mean, you can um, see how this might, might work. Um, and the loss is apparently uh, fairly random. Um, are, there, are there any more questions about that? Um, I think that, uh, although th personally th th this type of work in the laboratory is a drudge, I mean, th they've worked very hard to, to make these human gene assignments, that it really is quite a breakthrough. And I'm sure that we're going to be hearing about it probably even in the Des Moines Register within the next year or so. Um, but now I want to just skip on from that to the second way in which these mouse-human hybrids um, can be used. And that's this right here. The, it's used, they're used in the studies of differentiation. Uh, and these are very beginning, very tentative studies, but they're beginning to give some answers. The vital question in um, differentiation is why, you know, we start out with, uh, uh, from an egg and a sperm which unite to find, form a little zygote, and then we develop into this uh, person uh, composed of unique tissues. You know, why does this happen? Um, and that's a, the one of, obviously one of the central problems of biology today, as it has been for years. Um, another slide here. Oops. Um, there is a question which is asked, and that is, now suppose you have a very differentiated cell, which is your skin cell. Has this cell lost the ability, uh, lost other genetic information which it contains? Could it ever be anything but a skin cell? Uh, is the development of the cell due to loss of something in the growth of the body? And there were some experiments which are, are quite famous and a little old now, several years ago, uh, which in a sense answered that question. They were done by a man named Gurdon in England. He, uh, and this was the experiment. He took an unfertilized egg. Um, this egg, of course, has a nucleus in it. But he was able to, to use ultraviolet radiation. And it is true that this UV radiation, if directed just properly, will remove the nucleus from the egg. 
which is what he did. It simply evaporates the nucleus. The nucleus is hit and nothing else is disturbed. All the cytoplasm is still there. Now, he went to, to a tadpole of the same stream and he, he went to the intestine and took out the lining of the intestine took these, cell, these cells out. And here's a picture of the epithelial cells from the lining of this tadpole intestine. And then he developed a, a little pipette, a little hollow glass cylinder, which fit directly over the nucleus of the intestinal cell, and uh, was able to withdraw just the nucleus, leaving behind the cytoplasm. And then he took the intestinal nucleus and put it into this egg that it, that it had its own uh, nucleus removed. Now, what happened? And there are three things that happened. Uh, occasionally, nothing would happen. Everything would die. Occasionally, he would, there would be some development of an organism, but then it would be an abnormal embryo and die. But, but rarely, but most importantly, occasionally, he'd get the development of a complete mature frog. Now, what this means, of course, is that this very differentiated, highly, highly uh, evolved cell here has all the information in it necessary for making a complete frog. So these, th these experiments were fantastic, and they really answer that question. It means that, that virtually, as far as we know, that we can expect that all of the cells of our body contain all of the potential for making an organism. Uh, there, are, what are the reasons, then, that a liver cell just doesn't go ahead and develop into something else? Um, now, and the, these could be called the questions of, of differentiation. Um, does it mean that in the liver cell that, that we've had liver cell functions turned on somehow in development? Are they just sort of switched on with a light switch, you know? Or does it mean that, that a cell starts out in the embryo with all of its functions on, and there is some method of using a switch to turn off some of them and just leaving the others on. You see, maybe you've had your nerve cell functions turned off and only your liver cell function stays on. You know. And these are the very questions, you see, of, of differentiation. Um, using these somatic cell hybrids, One is able to take a nerve cell, for example, and I'm going to write a cross here as a mating symbol. Use a nerve cell, and by means of sendivirus and that selection system I told you about, mate it with, um, say, a liver cell, and we've got a hybrid out. Now, this is a um, not necessarily between two species, but it's the two different cell types, you know, within a species. Now, this hybrid is a, a nerve liver cell, so to speak. Nerve liver. Okay. Now, the, the two, uh, well, well, at least one of two things can happen. Uh, the first one is that you retain both the nerve function and the liver function or that you, you have one or the other, or I say the third one is being no specialized function at all. Now, a great number of such uh, fusions have been made between different types of highly developed cells. Uh, melanin producing cells have been made with skin cells. Nerve cells have been made with, with blood cells, liver cells. Uh, have been have been made with skin cells, um, and in general, the results have come out uh, number three that whatever the function was, the, the specialized function that you're looking at up here, it generally disappeared in the hybrid. Now this may mean that there is negative control. That is, if you have a liver, if liver function is on. There's something there which says nerve control be off. And this one is, it says nerve function be on, liver control be off. And when you put them together, there, there, are, there are off signals for both of these. And so you get something.
something with no specialized function. Um, this may be the case. Um, the, the most interesting experiments, though, have been have come out not with negative data like that, which may be quite true, and uh, that remains to be seen, but have been in situations like this, um, a particular cross in which skin cells were crossed with liver cells. These happened to be mouse skin cells, and these were rat liver cells. And in the hybrid, they had, well, they actually got several types of hybrid, but there was one particular one which was of great interest, in which um, there was a rat liver function, which was the production of, of a rat albumin. And in addition, they got the skin cell to turn on its making its liver function, which was making albumin. You got a mouse liver function out of a mouse skin cell. Now, and, and there are several, beginning now to be several other cases like this that are showing up. Uh, when this happens, one, you can only assume that there is something in the nucleus of the rat liver cell which is able to activate uh, the ability of this, this, this completely potential mouse uh, skin cell to perform a liver function. And of course, uh, biochemists are hot after this. What is this factor that does it? And so we may begin now to get some answers in terms of differentiation by using uh, somatic cell hybrids uh, of this type. Um, I, I don't, I'm not going to go into the cancer work yet because it's too new, but it looks a little hopeful maybe in a couple of years. Um, I wanted to close in the last couple of minutes um, just on a, a, well, it may seem a kind of a strange note. Um, this, that is, the ability to grow human cells in culture, you know, uh, has led to a lot of very interesting biological experiments. It has also led to thousands of chemical experiments, you know, that we could spend a couple of years going into. Um, and these are forming a very solid uh, scientific background for what's becoming known as gene therapy or genetic surgery. I don't know if you've read this in the newspaper. Uh, in the Des Moines Register on July 1st, there was, uh, starting July 1st, there was a series of articles on uh, bad genes in the population and whatnot. Anyway, they mentioned this gene therapy, genetic surgery. Well, what the problem is, is this, is that as medicine has gotten more and more competent, uh, it's been able to pull people who would otherwise have died because of some genetically inherited defect, you see, through the childbearing age. And, and they have children, and the defect is passed on. And it's passed on in such large numbers that, it's that, that genetically inherited defects are building up in the population to the extent that a very famous Nobel Prize winning geneticist um, made the statement that 25% of all hospital beds in this country are occupied with people who have some form of a genetic disease. Uh, that's an awful lot of sick people because of deleterious genes in the population. Um, there are several. The question then is, uh, you know, what, what are you going to do about it? And uh, this genetic surgery is one approach that I'm going to mention. Um, this involves actual replacement of a, is a chromosome. It's a uh, chromosome that, that um, has something to do with insulin production. And right here on this chromosome is a faulty piece of DNA that says make no insulin. Genetic surgery involves taking a good piece of chromosome and putting it artificially, either by means of a virus or some other means that they're working on right now, at the lab where I was last year, and putting in a good piece of DNA here so that a person is able to make his own insulin. Um, now this is a, a very, uh, you know, this kind of genetic surgery is a, would be a very worthwhile kind of thing to do. I mean, it would alleviate a lot of suffering. Um, but just like um, other problems that have come up in the past, people who are working in this area, they're just, they're right in the doorway, and there's the Roman god of portals. There's Janus with his two heads. On, on one face, he looks at these very beneficial sorts of 
of things. And um, the signals are all, go ahead and do your research while it's going to be done anyway. <laughs> the other head is a little, little more pessimistic because um, I heard a very interesting discussion a couple of years ago by a, a very famous guy named Jonathan Beckwith at Harvard. And he is extremely alarmed that uh, there will be um, almost as in the case with the atomic bomb, that things escape before you have proper perspective or proper control. You see, if you can take DNA and introduce it into people's chromosomes, you have an equal opportunity for introducing deleterious genes. I mean, you have as much an opportunity for introducing deleterious genes as you do for introducing pieces of, of chromosome material which will make up for some difficulty. Yeah. Well, it's not exactly an operation. A virus, uh, this is all, there are a lot of experiments I can, can tell you about in great detail, but a virus will bear this piece of DNA in, and it will actually, by natural, uh, things that go on naturally in your cells all the time, is recombined into the chromosome. Right there. It's a natural process, which can now be manipulated and exploited a little bit. I mean, we're doing, I mean, there's so much scientific background work being done in laboratories, you know, with mammalian cells and whatnot. But all the techniques are practically worked out. Some of them are worked, I mean, many of them are worked out. There are a few little questions about it. Well, suppose you were first diagnosed to have diabetes. Theoretically, you could be given enough of this good DNA, this piece of DNA that would make insulin, that it would get in the proper organs and produce insulin for you. At any, any time in life. Whether or not you could substitute uh, in the germ cells, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's, a, you know, I uh, don't really know yet. But, yeah. Um, yeah, if you couldn't do it in the germ cells, you'd have the same problem with the bad genes being passed on. Wouldn't you? Yeah, that's right. You, you continually have the same problem if you couldn't do it in the germ cells. But you would have the, the uh, opportunity to cure someone of the disease or the opportunity if, if um, you so chose to convert somebody to a mental retardate, you know, by putting in the wrong kind of sequences of DNA. And so it's a, you know, there, there, are, there are going to be um, more and more uh, ethical problems and problems of control. I mean, you know, this, this summer we've all seen how the misuse of power, you know, and it's a little frightening to think that, uh, you know, there are these, this is just one of a series of potent biological um, weapons or tools, you know, and uh, improperly used, they're, they're very dangerous. And that's why it's terribly important for people in the public, I think, to be very well informed about them. Presumably, you'd want to enter, uh, to do this, have this operation occur as soon as possible. Yes. In the embryological yeah. development. Right. Because after all the cells have developed in particular tissue, you might have millions of cells. Right, that's right. That virus would have to replace each gene in each cell or <coughs> enough of them so that you get a certain level of your, your thing. But uh, this has already been tried, actually, uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, there are twins in Germany that, that suffer a disease which uh, in a certain amount of uh, mental retardation, and they were young kids then, right, twins. This disease came from the buildup of the, of the chemical arginine blood. Now, ordinarily, this is broken down by an enzyme, arginase. And uh, there was family permission given, and the kids were treated with virus, which had um, a p piece of DNA, which had arginase on it, and uh, hoping for some uh, massive recovery. Um, that a little information has come out about it. There was some initial success. I don't know what's happened, you know, in the last, last year. But uh, this is the first field project I know of. But the, uh, the, the scientific techniques are, are all, all there, or almost all there. And um, it's very likely. How would they know if the, uh, if the uh, gene had actually been inserted into the chromosome of, of At the, the prop patient? proper spot? Or uh, even reason? inserted anywhere, uh -huh. uh, rather than just being uh, replicated, say, with the virus and transcribed, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. If, it, if, um, if you get a positive response, it can be on the virus. In fact, that some of the, the, there are two labs I know right now that are trying to prove that, in fact, this is integrated into the chromosome. Now, we know that virus is integrated into the chromosome. And these are people called experiments, all right? 
so far in the laboratory, uh, it's been shown very clearly that, that any kind of mammalian cell will take up this DNA in the virus. It will get in there, it will express itself, it will function, you know. And uh, there is some data which is very complicated to explain. It has to do with separations of different kinds of DNA, which indicates that, in fact, it, it is uh, recombined into the chromosome. But these are the experiments that have not been, I mean, they aren't, you know, perfectly conclusive yet. But as far as the individual is concerned, it doesn't really take up. That's right. If even if it stays in there on a virus and yeah. does its job, it doesn't matter. University? Yeah, yeah I'm doing some. <laughs> a little bit, yeah, among other things. <laughs> I'll tell you about it. So. Uh, yeah, it's, it's important to do. It's, uh, as I said, it's not the, those are not the most exciting experiments in the world to do. So I plan to do some of them. I mean, I will do some of them, you know, and then do a few other things too. But, um. Are there any other questions? Thank <laughs> you.